Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot known locally as the February Room is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. In episode 48, Michael Reed joined me on the podcast to share about his record bluefin tuna. Since then, a lot has happened in Michael's life. Namely, he's become an author and recently published the book, The Painting, which is right now probably my favorite book, my top five favorite books of all time. So we invited him back on to discuss his novel based on a true story about Roberto Ramos. And I can't wait to talk to you about this book. Thank you so much for joining me today, Michael. Well, you're very welcome, man. I really appreciate you having me. To say it's an honor for me. And when I say that this is one of my favorite books, I have, I told you this before, I have my collection in my February room that we have downstairs. And it's books that we just really cherish. And I have A River Runs Through, a river runs through it, river Y, and now the painting is on my shelf. It's one of these books that you read and it gives you anxiety, it gives you tears, and it gives you a lot of pride on what the human spirit can do. And I think in order to, in the spirit of the February room, uh, we're going to read a page from your book that deals with fishing because um, as a Cuban culture, uh, we had Ernest Hemingway. Fishing is very part of the community, um, the lifestyle of the Cubans. And um, can't wait, wait wait for you to share this story with everyone. So at this time of year, it's it's Wahoo, so it's in the winter time. And the reason they're out in the ocean, um, Roberto had purchased a boat. And the motor in the boat, it was an older boat, the motor was really not sufficient for what they wanted to do. And so the captain of the boat, who was the former owner, put a new motor in and they were sea trialing the boat. Uh, but at the same time, they thought, well, if we're going out in the ocean, we might as well do a little fishing. Um, and, and, in, and in doing so, they wouldn't attract the attention of the Cuban Coast Guard. So uh, in Cuba at the time, I'm not sure if it's still the case, you're, you're, anyone was not really al allowed or able to just get a boat and go in the ocean and go fishing. You had to have a special permit from the government to, to go fishing. Um, and they were very hard to get. And the reason Roberto bought this boat was, number one, it was a pretty solid boat. And also the captain, his friend Pedro, had a fishing license uh, and it was very important um, just to be able to be out on the ocean without drawing suspicion from uh, from the Coast Guard. And we should probably say that this is taking place in 1980? At this point in the in the book it's probably around 1990 by then. Okay. So a lot had happened in the previous uh, four or five years or seven or eight years I guess. Uh, so this is right, right around 1989, 1990, something like that. So we, we have Roberto, Pedro, and is it Mara is his girlfriend at the time? Yeah, Maura. Going fishing, and they're going to try and see, let's figure out what this boat can do. But in order to avoid any kind of suspicion from the government, they're going to go fishing. And also because they need to, uh, they need to feed their families in a government that was not feeding their people. Yeah, certainly in communities along the, uh, along the ocean. So this community is very well known. It's called Kohimar, and it's where Ernest Hemingway kept the Pilar. Um, it's just a little bit east of Havana, and it's on the Kohimar River. It flows uh, north into the ocean 
Um, so they left from the little, um, the little, uh, it's not really a marina, it's just um, where everyone kept their boats, rickety old docks. Um, so anyway, I'll just, I'll kind of set the scene as to what it looked like, uh, and then we can go from there. So the sky was overcast, and with no wind, the surface of the ocean was oil calm, except where the current rips formed from the deep water eddies that spun off the Gulf Stream pushed against the ledge that ran along the northern edge of the island. The fishermen called the eddies boils, and on calm days when conditions were best for drift fishing, the bar, the sound made by the water boiling to the top could be heard at a great distance. Um, so it was pretty slick calm. Um, and like I said, they were fishing for Wahoo, which in the winter time is a little bit more common in the in the Caribbean. It's a good time of year to fish for them. You troll for them at a little bit higher speed. So they're in the Gulf Stream, which runs very close to the island, uh, and they hook a couple fish. So I'll just I guess I could just pick up after they've they've hooked these these fish. You could clearly see the neon blue vertical stripes common to all pelagic game fish spaced along the fish's side through the prop wash. The fish's mouth was fully open and the hook was firmly lodged in the hinge of the jaw. Maura, I'm going to need your help, said Pedro. When I tell you to slowly pull down on the line toward the reel and crank at the same time until I tell you to stop. Pedro, you want me to help? asked Roberto. No, no, you stay on your fish and keep him coming, yelled Pedro. Maura can handle this. With each turn of the reel handle Mauro made, Pedro was able to slide his hand down the line in the direction of the fish. Finally, he was able to grab the weight and gain control of the fish. Damn it, yelled Pedro. You bastard. What happened, shouted Roberto, turning around to see. Big tiger, answered Pedro. He's at least 14 feet. In a single motion, Pedro slid the meter and a half long fish up to the surface along the side of the boat and stuck the gaff deep into the thick shoulder meat behind the gill plate. Just before he was able to pull the fish from the water, the shark struck, taking most of the tail and a section of meat from the underside behind the caudal fin. Before the shark had hit again, Pedro dropped the weight, then gripped the gaff with both hands as near as he dared to the hook end of the gaff in order to gain more leverage, safely lifting the fish clear of the water onto the deck where it lay quivering, its mouth frozen open. So that's the first fish, and they had another one they had another one hooked up. The shark is probably on him too, replied Pedro. I'm going to swing the boat around and head toward the fish. You crank as fast as you can and don't let any slack come in the line. I see him now, Pedrito, he yelled. He'll go a good 50 kilos. In no time, Pedro had closed on the fish and made up most of the line still out on Roberto's rod and now had him less than 10 meters from the boat. Roberto, although tired from the fight, continued to reel aggressively, knowing the big tiger could easily end things at any moment. Keep him coming, Roberto. Okay, step toward the bow and raise the rod a little, said Pedro, calmly as he grabbed the line. As soon as I gaff him, you back off on the drag. Before Pedro finished giving Roberto the instructions, they saw the great shark emerge from under the boat. It swam slowly a short distance directly away from the stern, then again, picking up the scent of the struggling fish, made a quick turn back toward the Wahoo, which Roberto now had alongside the boat. Stick him, yelled Roberto. At the precise moment Pedro sunk the gaff into the Wahoo, the tiger struck, slamming Roberto's fish into the side of the boat with enough force that it broke the wire leader. I don't have him anymore, Pedrito, yelled Roberto. Get the other gaff, it's under the washboard on the port side, said Pedro. Pedro struggled to keep the limp body of the wahoo, which had been near, cut nearly in two at a point on the body below the dorsal fin, out of the water and away from the shark. The shark had let go after biting off and swallowing whole a two foot long section of belly meat and was coming again. Try and gaff the tail, Roberto, quick, shouted Pedro. Again, the massive one-ton tiger struck, this time from under the boat, tearing off the back half of the fish before Roberto could sink the gaff. Pedro, his shoulders slumped, lifted what remained of the big wahoo over the washboard and let go of the gaff with his left hand as the fish thumped onto the deck, bloody, lifeless, next to the first fish, then sat down on the port washboard to catch his breath. And you can relate to that exhaustion, how exhausting it can to be bringing in a fish like that since we've had you on and you've had your record 
uh, tuna catch. So you know that exhaustion. Oh yeah, yeah, and I know the you know the frustration of losing a you know a, a nice fish to a shark at the at the edge of the boat. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't say that I've had that experience, but um, I hope to one time have the disappointment because I guess having the opportunity just to be go fishing um, and catching a big fish like that is still an experience. But, you know, I think what we need to do, Michael, is let's talk about what is going on in 1980 and 1990 in Cuba. I think when people are like, why are people nervous about the Coast Guards? What, why would they be nervous? I mean, we have to set it back. What is going on with Fidel in Cuba and the people? In, in the early days, or in the early 80s, um, things were still pretty good in Cuba. But throughout the 80s, it, um, it began to deteriorate as the uh, economic support from the Soviet Union began to dry up. Um, so people were becoming more and more desperate, um, just for, you, you know, food and, and, uh, what they needed to, you know, sustain life on a daily basis. Um, so by the early nineties, um, it, it, people were really desperate. Of course, in the eighties, you had the Mariel boat lift where, um, I forget how many thousands of people were involved with that, but. Um, that was an enormous operation where basically anyone that wanted to leave could leave, but um, it was it was very disorganized and, and obviously pretty dangerous. There was a lot of boats came from the U.S. to pick up people. Um, a lot of people that came in the Mariel boat lift were, you know, came from prisons and um, and um, you know psychiatric institutions. So. It was not as though, you know, you were getting all the great, the, the greatest minds in Cuba that were coming to the U.S. It was a, it was a really chaotic situation for um, quite a few months. Um, and I don't know how much you want to talk about what, you know, what Roberto was going through at the time. I mean, we don't need to reveal what well, happened really, in the book, but yeah, I mean, really, this was after. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis was in nineteen. 19- in 1960 so cuban and americans um affairs like we've cut off borders we're not allowed to visit right and fidel is at this point starting to become a little bit paranoid right that his the soviets aren't funding um funding the country anymore they're losing money and so fidel is starting to put a little bit more i don't know how to say it but he's putting a lot of pressure on the on the people to pay for his lifestyle Right? Would yes, that be uh, safe to yeah, say? Yeah, absolutely. And and there's um there's a part of the story that I wrote about um having to do with an operation that um Fidel was behind um to raise money that um I won't I won't tell you what it is or reveal what it is to the listeners, but because it's a really, really interesting um uh part of the story. Um but it nearly led the, Fidel's decision to have this operation um, nearly led to um, the U.S. considering invading Cuba in order to put a stop to it. So um, there was a lot going on uh, at the time in Cuba, um, you know, having to do with um, the economy deteriorating and basically falling apart. Um, and it was was pretty perilous for the people, uh, especially anyone engaged in black market activities, which, um, which involved Roberto. When I say black market, it, it you know, it, it, it considered black market by the Cuban government, not by, you know, sort of the average person. It was, um, you know, something we wouldn't, we would never uh, describe as or consider to be black market. I would say probably <clears throat> black market in Cuba is doing something that Fidel does not agree with or supporting people who disagree with his vision of what Cuba needs to be. And so let's talk about that because Roberto has a pa- his black market, I think it's safe to say, is Cuban art. Correct. And a lot of those people were either punished um, these artists were punished for depic- depicting things that 
was going against what Fidel's um, wanted the culture to be or his regime or people who were against him. So let's talk about the painting. Let's talk about Roberto and maybe we can at least give readers or listeners listeners a little peek on what this book is really about. Yeah, and how it started. Which is more sure. than just a painting. Yes. Sure. Um, so I, I, I probably ought to just give a little bit background of, on, on who he is um, and how I met him. Uh, so Roberto and, and his wife uh, and family, they live in Miami. Um, and he has an establishment in Little Havana uh, called Cuba Ocho. And um, I first went there, I think it was three or four years ago. Um, and it's, I mean, ostensibly it's a bar, but it's not really. A, you go in and it's floor to ceiling, pre-revolution Cuban art, along with some remarkable other uh, architectural elements. And um, it's really a, an amazing place. So it's a bar, museum, and cultural center. So um, I was immediately, you know, kind of mesmerized by the place when I went in. And fortunately, he was there that day, and um, I got to meet him and hear his story. And um, that's kind of the beginning of the, you know, the inspiration for wanting to write about it. Um, So in 1982, he was 17 years old. Um, He was a national taekwondo and karate champion, uh, soon to enter the military. Everyone, uh, any male at the age of 18 was conscripted into the military in Cuba. Um, His brother, older brother, one of his older brothers, he's one of five boys, he has, and he has one sister, um, had an elderly friend he was very close to. His brother, Carlos, was severely autistic, but brilliant. Um, and he agreed to help this elderly gentleman move his belongings. He was in his mid-90s. He was a, uh, a doctor and had retired and needed to move into a smaller place. So Roberto agreed to help his brother move the belongings of this guy. And... Um, when, the, when he got done, they were expecting to be paid, you know, with money, and, and the guy didn't have any money, and he, he gave him a painting, uh, a small painting um, uh, called El Saxophonista. It's sort of a Cubist-style uh, uh, painting of a saxophone which player. Is the, which is the cover of the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's a small painting, like maybe 11 by 13 or 14 inches. And... Of course, Roberto was super disappointed. He wanted the money. Uh, his brother was not so disappointed. He, he was intrigued by the painting, and the owner of the painting, the old man, had told them that it was done by a very famous artist, and if they wanted to, they could probably sell it for quite a bit more money than what he would have paid them. So <clears throat> they took it reluctantly, and, um, and in the following days went to research it, to try and find out who the artist was, and they could find no, no references in anywhere in any museum uh, about this artist. So Roberto thought the guy was, you know, not entirely honest with them about the value of this painting. And uh, uh, but they continued their research, and finally were able was able, they were able to find some information about the artist. And in fact, he had won the National Painting Award. Uh, I think it was in 1957 uh, for the country. He was a very famous painter, but he kind of ran afoul of the government because he was opposed to the, the um, you know, the communist regime. And uh, he left, lived out his days in Spain, uh, died in Spain. And the Cuban people knew nothing about this guy. Um, so that really started Roberto's interest in art. Um, and it, it developed from there and, um, and, and now he, he has the largest collection of pre-revolution Cuban art in the world. And obviously a lot has happened in between, um, which the, the, a lot of really remarkable and amazing stories, uh, that he's told me, um, and many of which are, are in the book. So that's kind of the beginning of how I met him and then how he became introduced to, uh, art. Well, and a little bit about Roberto, reading this book, I love Roberto, but he certainly in a, in a communist, um, place, he definitely pushes (laughs) the, the limits of what he can and can't do, but he seems 
like he does it with positivity. Every time he gets in trouble, he's like, this is not right. Like he never gets down. Like he, you capture who Roberto is so well in this book because he is one that is determined and he's also the most um, caring for his family, friends. Um, and he just seems like he has a really positive energy that life isn't going to get him down, that he was going to see the other side despite the amount of hardship that he endured while living under Fidel Castro. Yeah, he's a he's a very determined person in, in a very good way. Um, if you, um, I, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but I feel like if you, you know, if you hang around Roberto enough, good things are going to happen to you. Um, and uh, he's incredibly generous. He's incredibly loyal. He's very forgiving, probably to a fault, um, because he has, you know, people take advantage of him from time to time. But um, he, he's, um, he has absolutely no anxiety about anything, which I think leads to his, um, you know, his positive attitude about life and his, and his willingness to just try anything. I mean, uh, he's, he's one of those people that are just like game for anything, um, he sent me a video recently. He was in Montreal, Quebec, and he was ice fishing, which, I mean, I can't even imagine. If I hadn't seen the video, I wouldn't have been able to imagine it, but he's in this parka sitting over this little hole, and he's so excited. Um, and he's saying, you know, and he's got this tiny little ice fishing rod, and he's talking about he has this fish on that's too big for the hole, and somebody has to, and he's just carrying on like a little kid, and that's kind of who he is. Um, I've watched many videos uh, of him talk about, you know, his life and his, his work and his paintings and um, m most of which are in Spanish and so I don't understand them fully, but he's super animated and you can tell, uh, even if you didn't understand a word of Spanish, you could tell that this is a really um, remarkable person. And even though he is, is an amazing, like nice person, there's also things that he's, he's also a weapon, right? Like you don't want to, you don't want to push the wrong buttons with him at the same time, because he's also a professional Taekwondo. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Taekwondo and karate. And that comes in handy for him at certain places in this book where he has to use his skill set on a particular situation that is, um, tends to be, is very dangerous for him. Yeah, 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 in, in order to save his life, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He, um, you know, he was trained to kill with his hands by the, by the you know, in the army. Um, and he was trained by uh, two of the top Taekwondo teachers in the world at the time in the 1980s um, from North Korea. Um, Cuba had they had very good teams, but they, they didn't really have the training that like Korea and maybe Iran and maybe Russia had. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's really hard for me to imagine him, you know, being able to do what, what I, I know that he, you know, used to do, but you know, he, he had, his, he had his limits and, and, uh, he was, he was pushed to the limit on several occasions, but fortunately managed to survive. I mean, it's, there's so many times in this book that I was clenching my teeth because I'm like, why, you know, I always, as reading this book, and as I think any um, reader who will grab this book will think, what does freedom mean to me? And where am I, would I be able to push myself as Roberto did? And I really did have to question myself because I also find myself to be very much a rule person where if someone says you can't do this, um, I would I would probably listen. Like I've never, I rarely got in any trouble just because I'm just a rule follower. And I wonder in, I put myself in Roberto's shoes. Like if I was in his place in a, in a communist country, would I push the limits? And I don't, I don't know if I would. I'd be so scared of, of. I mean, the things that um, the government would do is like if they saw you driving a car that was beyond your means, you'd be arrested. And it did. And it's not like you go, you get arrested and you get a, uh, a date set with the judge. It is like based on maybe a year or two. They're like, oh, now you get to see the judge. 
but the conditions are awful. You're sitting in prison waiting for that opportunity, not knowing if that'll happen, if the if the person, the warden is a fan of you or not. Like there's so many elements that freedom is taken away. And this is a country where a lot of people's at that time, Roberto didn't even know what that even, what freedom was. No, absolutely not. And it, I mean, it is a great question. Um, and he repeatedly was, uh, risked his life in, in order to take another step further in his quest to be free. And uh, I, you know, like you said, I don't know if I, I could do what he did. Um, he, he, um, he's a very brave person. I, I, I don't know how else to describe that, you know, part of his, his, uh, his, his character. Well, and what I love is that you really, I think what we need to question is what is freedom? Like we can say, we have our constitution rights, like here in America, you know, we have our amendments and these are what our freedom, uh, this is what we have for freedom. But for people in Cuba at the time, had no clue what that even felt like, what it looked like. And in the book, if you don't mind if I quote it, um, we have on page 130, um, we're gonna set it, uh, Roberto is in prison and he's with his colleagues and they're sitting there and he, Roberto is kind of talking about his dream about, you know, starting his own gallery. And um, it goes, uh, he's talking to one of the prisoners. We're going to make it, Enrique. And you too, Barbero. Once you know what it feels like to be free, nothing less, nothing less will do. How do you know when the feeling is true? Asked Barbero. Well, for you, Barbero, surely you remember stepping up to the plate when you felt completely relaxed and you were full of confidence and the ball that day looked as big as a football. When it left the pitcher's hand, your balance was perfect. And when you swung the bat, every movement seemed effortless. And at the point of contact with the ball, the feeling was like none other. The sound of the bat cleanly striking the ball was sharp but thick and fat sounding. And you felt the baseball compress lightly. Your hands were relaxed. So the feeling was somewhat soft but solid. And even though you had, feeling, and even though you had felt the feeling many times before, it still felt new and wonderful. That fleeting moment of perfection that you and you alone had created was all you ever wanted. And for an instant, you felt free, truly free, said Roberto. And that made me think, what does freedom mean to me? And I really have to think about, I mean, for, we talked about this, sometimes fishing can feel that way when you're on the water and it's the elements and you're like working towards something and you have that, 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 you know, when you hook it, right. That is that moment where I think it, cause you don't know what's on the other line, but you're excited. And it's that just that one second. And I think for a lot of people, we have to remember what does Rita mean to us? And I think this book pushes, like, if you don't have to fight for it, you know, like Roberto does, I don't know. It just, it just really, it meant, it meant a lot to me reading this book, thinking about what freedom meant to me. Yeah, the, um, you know, I wanted to, I, the, I wanted to include some references to um, baseball in the book because it's such an, a, a huge part of the culture. Um, and I think it, it's also been a pretty high profile in terms of, um, you know, international news with many defections uh, through the years of, of Cuban baseball players to, that wanted to come and play, you know, in the United States in the big leagues. And um, so it's really high profile. But for the Cuban people, baseball is, is such an escape from the daily, I mean, I can only imagine, I, you know, I'm not Cuban, I, I'm not I don't lead a life of desperation. So, but for them, it, it, it must be such a wonderful escape, um, you know, momentary escape uh, from, from all of the, you know, misery that they confront on a daily basis. Um, that, you know, I wanted to, I, that's why I wanted to include something about, about baseball um, in the book. And I, I, that's actually one of my favorite passages from the book as well. Yeah, it just it just hit me in such um, 
And I think that's when you notice, when you know a book is really good, when it starts to question who you are and what you have been able to experience in your life with really, you know, for the most part, not really having much hardship. I mean, I think everyone can probably say that the past like two years has been really hard. But like when you think about what is what has been difficult um, and what Roberto has gone through, it's it, it you know, it just it just makes you do more reflection on your own life. And, um, you know, and I also think that, you know, I also wanted to ask because um, when it says a novel based on a true story, this book is really based on really actual events but there is some characters had to add in there to just kind of uh develop but the majority of these people are are real i would say um maybe a third of them or or maybe a little less are not real and and the others are real people robert but we know that the experiences that he had that he endured those are all true events. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. All of the really significant things that happened um, were um, events that he described to me in in uh, great detail. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so curious, Michael. How do you come? Because <laughs> I mean, you just you just first off, you're an amazing. You build a beautiful boats. I mean, I'm not just saying like a rowboat. You're building amazing, beautiful skiff boats. How? Did you, when you were coming up with this uh, book idea, how how did it all come together? Like, were you just like one day you're like, I'm going to sit here and write a book? Well, or did you just think that this book needed to be told because we have not heard a story like this before? Well, I immediately, when he told me this story, I was like, God, why isn't, you know, why hasn't somebody written a book about this guy or made a movie about this guy? And he told me, he said, well, a lot of people have promised and and I, you know, and I, I thought about it and I thought, I know a couple, I know kind of indirectly, some directly, a couple movie producers. So I thought, I'm going to write a, a little synopsis and send it to a couple of people. And so well, a friend of mine it was is friends, pretty good friends with um, Eric Roth, who wrote uh, Forrest Gump. He's a screenwriter. And sent it to him, and, and he's like, you know, I don't write screenplays from synopsis. He, he, he said, tell your friend it's got to be a book. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll try and write a book. And um, so I, I literally just, my wife was out of town. I just sat down one night, and I started writing. And I, to be honest with you, I don't know where most of this stuff came from. Um, but once, once I kind of put myself like in Roberto's, not not in his, sort of in his mind, I guess you'd say. Um, I just started to live in his world. And, um, I, you know, I just tried to imagine everything he was experiencing on a daily basis and, and write about it as best I could. So a lot of times I'd sit down and write and I would have no idea what I was gonna write about that day. And, you know, four or five hours later, I'd have, you know, a page or two. And um, I, I just, I, that's the way I went about it. So, uh, I mean, I knew what I wanted to include in terms of the really important, you know, significant events in his life, which, which led up to his, um, you know, wanting or leaving Cuba. Um, but I had no idea how I was going to go about you know, describing what it was like to, you know, be in solitary confinement in a, you know, an old Spanish prison in, in Havana. It was just like, you know, I've never been in prison, so. I mean, that's, I mean, but you do such a great job. And I know we talked about it becoming a movie because I was like, oh, I have all the characters in my mind who I want to play. Uh, Roberto and... Um, but I think when I, when I was asking you, I was like, how long did it take you to write this book? And didn't you say like 16 months? I am, you just blow my mind because I'm just not a very, I'm a good storyteller when it comes to talking to people, but writing my word, like writing on paper, typing it up, I could not do it. And I'm just so amazed. I'm always so, ta I mean, I think having a skill set of being able to write a story and keep people engaged because what's so great about this book is every 
every page you're turning is a new scene with new, um, you know, new elements of, of drama, but also like there's hope in the in the near future, but your teeth are grinding. You're like, how are we going to, how is Roberto going to get out of this? And um, I also feel that you did such a great job with the characters because I feel that even though Roberto has always been determined based on where he wanted to be in the future, he could not have done it without the people around him. Oh, absolutely. And, and how they're all so connected with each other. Like the fact that his bad time being in, in prison kind of led to him meeting somebody else that might possibly help him in the future. And I just thought that was just, um, you know, when you kind of think about the world and how we're all somewhat connected, like we all kind of come together somehow in the future, you know, people that well, you don't really think about. Yeah, he. I mean, he's the kind of guy that has that, um, that power of intention where, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in the world and every one of them's different. And, um, he's not, you know, even remotely, uh, sort of Machiavellian in his, um, approach to friendship, but, um, he's engaging. And, um, I mean, every time I go to visit him and I'm sitting in, in his place, I meet, the most remarkable people that have all kind of been attracted to him and the place. And, um, many of them are refugees, Cuban refugees. And he, um, he just has a way of imagining what he wants his life to be and then have it happen. Um, it's, uh, it's a great, you know, it's, it's, it's a great lesson to learn, I think. And he, he's, he's learned it well. I mean, I don't know if it's innate, but he certainly has it. And what do you feel that you want the readers to take away from this book? Oh, boy, that's a that's a great question. I wish I'd known you were going to ask that question. Uh, <laughs> I would say um, probably getting back to um, what it means, what, what freedom really means, and, um, you know, to each, each person, um, and like you had mentioned before the the what's the price you're willing to pay for it um and by all means you know reflect on the fact that we should never ever take it for granted i mean it's um you know what what we have in this country is you know it's not like anywhere else in the world um certainly there's you know we could we could talk about you know everything that's wrong with this country but there's there's a lot of things that are right and um that's why that's why people want to come here um pe pe you know people like roberto and um um the the other three or four hundred thousand cubans that live in miami yeah i mean hence there's a little place called little havana you know and i think the other thing is just uh I've never been to Cuba, and I, I don't really know what is, have you been there recently? Like, what is the, I'm just kind of curious if, what is it like there right now? You know, after reading this, I'm like, has it changed at all? Is is uh, is it different? Um, well, it yeah. certainly, ch it changed a lot under, you know, the Obama administration. Things had opened up quite a bit. And it was very controversial the way he did it. Um, and I don't really know enough, I, I can't say enough about it to say, you know, what he was doing was the right way. But I mean, I think it was a good thing he did. Um, but it, it has since been sort of shut down again. And um, people in Cuba now are really desperate. Um, I mean, I have friends, Cuban friends, that their family lives in Cuba. And, you know, they regularly starve. I mean, they do not have enough to eat. And their, you know, medicine is in short supply. Um, People do a lot of foraging for medicinal plants and things like that. So it's not a, it's not a good situation right now. Um, and of course, as a response, the democracy movement in Cuba has really been fueled by the, um, the economic situation uh, and the desperation of the people. So that um, kind of picked up steam this summer. Um, and was was in the news for quite a while and is you know is is ongoing um it you know if i could explain a little bit about who who those people are and how that came to be and and uh you know if we have time but um 
it's things are changing in Cuba and people are really optimistic for the future. I mean, Cuban Americans that are really optimistic. I'm not sure how optimistic the people living in Cuba are, but well, it's probably had to take a lot of Robertos to make that happen. You know, it's people who pushed the envelope and really made it their destiny to feel what freedom means, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the, the current democracy movement is spearheaded primarily by artists and musicians. So um, those are the type of people that are, um, you know, wor working the hardest. First off, the people in Cuba, it just seems beautiful the way that you i've never been there before but it just feeling the culture and the colors and the warmth of like people really trying to help each other as much as possible with the means that they have like you also feel really sad um roberto's mother rosa he comes home i mean a little sneak peek but you know he's in he's in prison and um it's not just the first time he's in prison but his mom is like i'm so happy to have you home, but I cannot feed you. I mean, that to me as a mother, I am like, oh my gosh, like how can you just say like, I'm so happy you're here, but I'm so worried. Like you're gonna have to figure out how I'm gonna feed you. And as a parent, you just, you, you, you sense that amount of like hardship to not be able to feed your family. I mean, Lent alone, like I'm like, oh, I can't probably afford to go skiing this weekend. We went skiing last weekend. But when you really start to think about the fact that there's there's communities in Cuba and also, you know, everywhere where, you you know, you take that for granted. Yeah, and I think in in um, probably more so in a way in, in Latin culture, you know, family is, is really, really important. Um, I mean, it's important in all cultures, but I think particularly in Latin cultures. Um, uh, so it's the, the and especially the immediate family um, is, is very important. Um, and it was an enormous part of, um, you know, Roberta's life. Um, and unfortunately, they, you know, they had a lot of very difficult um very difficult years that they had to endure. Um, ultimately, things worked out, but um, it was it was not an easy process. Yeah. Well, you know, and Michael, if people are people are wanting to buy the book, where are they able to purchase this at their local bookshop? Is it, I know I have it on Amazon. Um, what's the best way for them to get their hands on this incredible book? Um, well, I recently um, um, switched to. Uh, a different press and I'm right now in the process it shouldn't take long of getting it um, um, set up on uh, Amazon or reset up on Amazon Barnes & Noble a bunch of different platforms as well as um, ebook um, so it'll be hard and soft cover and ebook uh, it might take a couple of weeks but I would say um, for people just to check on Amazon but that'll be the easiest way eventually is just probably go through Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, well, and the only criticism I had on my book that you sent me, I was like, you didn't sign it. I was like, there is one problem I have about this book that you did not sign my book. So I feel that we have to um, make a future fishing trip, which we talked about maybe in the future. Sure, sure. <laughs> and, and have you sign it because... I just know that this book is going to explode. Um, I think this is going to be on every in everybody's February Room bookshelf, and um, I think there's only good things that are going to come out. They're going to come out of this book for you, Michael. And I'm so happy to be on for the ride. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, I ultimately I'd really like this to be a movie and reach as many people as possible. And and you know, it's a way of honoring Roberto and his story and his struggles. So, I think is there a way, Michael? Should we? read a last paragraph for signing off? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, Roberto bought this boat uh, in Cohimar, which is where Ernest Hemingway kept his boat, and where Gregorio Fuentes, Hemingway's mate, lived and died. He lived to be, I think it was 103. Um, and so he was, Roberto was friends with him. I mean, everyone in the village knew him, and he's a legend. Um, so that's kind of why I included him in the book, and there was a couple, one or two um, brief conversations uh, in the book 
uh, with him. And there's there was one in particular where Fuentes talks about what how he what what freedom sort of means to him, or or what what situation is it that you know creates the feeling inside him that where he really truly feels free. So um, uh, I could maybe read a little bit from that. Okay, so it's at one evening there. It's Roberto, Gregorio, and Roberto's friend Pedro, who he bought the book from. They're sitting around um, the cabana in um, along the dock in Cojimar. Uh, so I'll just start. Let's see. Pedrito tells me you have a passion for old paintings, the old man said to Roberto. Yes, I guess you could say that. They saved my life on more than one occasion, said Roberto. I won't ask you about that, said Gregorio. I don't mind. I see each old work with, like a window to a world where I'm the one controlling how to think. They're liberating. They take me to a place where I feel free, said Roberto. I believe I understand, said the old man. For me, it has always been the sea and fishing. Once I learned the hard lesson of humility, which you must learn to be a good fisherman and to always do what the sea expects of you, it is the only place I have ever truly felt free. I will try and remember your words, Capitan, said Roberto. Um, and that, that was, uh, that was kind of the, one of the last times I think he ever saw Gregorio Fuentes. Uh, I mean, I still get kind of emotional knowing where this is going to lead. And um, I love that you have, when you open up the book and you turn the page and it says, um, to the brave, wonderful people of Cuba. And that is who you dedicated this book to. And I just can't thank you enough for sharing Roberto's story. I hope at one point, I get to meet him because um, I'll have to pick up on my Spanish. I used to be very good and uh, meet him and um, and go fishing with you, Michael. And I just can't thank you enough for the work that you did in creating this book and for me to share it with the listeners of today's well, podcast. Well, you're very welcome, Lauren, and thanks for the time. Uh, it was really a pleasure. I uh, um, I have really enjoyed sharing it. I hope hopefully your listeners will um, enjoy the enjoy the podcast. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.